Hi everyone and welcome to TYT Interviews. Well, we all know that climate change is a huge problem. Uh, even worse than we think, the University of Illinois recently released research to show that uh, climate change may actually be worse than our previous worst case scenario. And if you think climate change isn't going to affect you here in California, well, you've got that wrong. Felicia Marcus, who is the Director of Water Resources here in the state of California under Governor Jerry Brown, recently went on the California Adapts podcast to warn Californians about the freight train of pain that's coming at the state of California as it struggles to deal with the increasing effects of climate change and also aging infrastructure. Um, there's threats from fire, drought, flood, sea level rise, and also increasing temperatures. Here to talk about uh, climate change and the effects of heat on human health, here from UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability, Alan Barreca, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Did I get all that right? You did. Ah, it. Great, great. So, Alan, you're probably the only professor that I know whose work has been ribbed by Stephen Colbert. And in case you haven't seen the clip, check it out. Turns out climate change might have a downside because a new study claims humans will have less sex on a warmer planet because, and this is a quote, hot weather leads to diminished coital frequency. <laughs> Also leading to diminished coital frequency, the phrase coital frequency. Now, it must be so much fun seeing your work on late night comedy, but coital frequency isn't the only thing that you work on. Tell me about your work. So I'm broadly interested in how the weather affects public health conditions. So thinking about what populations are most vulnerable and what we can do to protect them. And this, the interest in this work started back when I was in school and I saw a map of poverty around the world. And if you look, you actually see just like a large swath of poverty all in tropical countries. So it seems like globally that climate and economic well-being, economic development are tied together. Now, you could go to the United States and you'll see the exact same relationships. Really? So places in the south where the, it's just hotter and more humid, those places are also where it's poorer. So I wanted to know, like, how does climate or the weather influence our well-being? And I thought, you know, human health seems to be an important channel through which that could impact economic welfare. So I, so I got into, like... You know, I'm an economist and I love working with, with data. So I collected, you know, tens of millions of death records from the U.S. going back all the way to the early 20th century. Wow. And I matched up, you know, these death records with unusually hot periods. Mm -hmm. So say like it was like particularly hot month in Louisiana in 1933. And so I wanted to test whether or not there were more deaths following these, these heat waves. What did you find? And yes, and it's actually pretty striking. So in the early 20th century United States, uh, the risk of dying from, from extreme heat is pretty comparable to, say, like India today. So wow. we were really, really vulnerable. But that all changed like around the 1950s and 1960s. With? What, what, what happened in the 50s and 60s? So air conditioning adoption. Uh, uh, if, if you ask a lot of people, like, so I lived in New Orleans for about 10 years, and if you ask people that were, you know, born in the, like the early part of the century, what inventions they thought were some of the most profound or had the biggest impact in their lives, and they'd say air conditioning. And I'm here to say that actually the data back that up. The number of lives saved from air conditioning is actually pretty staggering. Wow. So over 100,000 lives have been saved in the U.S. alone. Thanks to air conditioning. Thanks to air conditioning. We don't often put air conditioning up there as one of the life-saving <laughs> yeah. inventions of the 20th yeah. century. Yeah, the polio vaccine, you know, that has a certain ring to it. But then you say, like, air conditioning, like Hoover. Like, that doesn't <laughs> quite have the same, the same cachet. So does that mean that no one dies of heat? anymore? No, actually, he like he kills quite a few people in the US still and definitely globally, especially places that don't have access to air conditioning. Uh, so in the US, uh, researchers that I've been working with, we figure about 5000 people per year die from from heat exposure. 5,000 a year in the United five, States. 5000 in the US. Wow. And, and the most vulnerable people are the elderly, um, and the very young. And so that obviously must happen in 
like really remote areas, never in urban centers. Well, well, the, the sad thing about living in, in an urban area is that you're actually exposed to even more heat from something that's called the urban heat island effect. So it can raise the temperature several degrees. What is that urban heat island effect? And does it happen here in LA? So it happens a lot in LA. So you can, you can imagine just being like surrounded by concrete. Actually, you don't have to imagine it in Los Angeles. There's just cr concrete everywhere. If you fly over over the city, it's just like gray for miles. Um, and uh, so that with lack lack of shade and lack of green, uh, this just you're just exposed to a lot of pavement and it's retaining heat and you're just just hotter because of that. So pavement just absorbs the heat. So better. urban areas like LA, mm -hmm. lots of concrete. Mm -hmm. Uh, that causes the area to become hotter. Correct. The urban heat island effect. That's that's it. Yeah. And then, then people die. Yes. So so there is some positives about being in a city. Like if you do live closer to work, that could potentially like save you time and save you money. Hopefully, you're using that money to you know use air conditioning. But if you're a low-income family, I think these energy high energy bills uh, during during extreme heat heat events, those are those are I mean those are killer. Like, like I, there was this, literally. Recent, yeah, literally like these, there was the study suggesting that families couldn't weather, um, or like, again, sorry for the pun, <laughs> like no they, pun intended. They, they, they couldn't weather $500 medical bills. So then you think about, can they weather $500 energy bills to protect themselves? And uh, my guess is no. So I want to touch on that and mm -hmm. the, the difference between, uh, we have a life-saving technology, not everyone has access to it. But mm -hmm. first of all, you were recently on the California Adapts Climate Change Podcast, and it's a very substantive piece of podcastery. Um, it covers all the issues in depth. I listened to it twice. And there was three main issues that kind of came out of mm -hmm. that that I want to talk to you about. So it's location, innovation, and motivation. The first of all is location. So you're saying that the urban heat island effect causes heat to the issue of heat, and especially with climate change, it's getting hotter, um, causes that problem to become even worse. Why do people still live here? I, I guess you want access to other amenities. So urban areas are actually, you know, you have access to coffee shops, you're closer to work. Um, you know, I think that you can see this in the data where, where people you know, previous generations, they moved out of the city. And now you're seeing wealthier and wealthier individuals move back into the city. You can look at like San Francisco, Seattle, like New York, even where it's now become like chic to live like downtown. Right in the middle of Manhattan. Yeah, like yeah. right in the middle. And and these people, they, like, they're, they're like, you know, they're bringing innovation, they're doing positive things, but that could be actually pushing low-income families out of downtown and that moves them farther and farther away from like their workplace and so they have to travel more and spend more money money on gas and transportation and that's that's problematic so these people they're living on the outskirts are people that can't afford to live in the city now with gentrification mm -hmm. living on the outskirts with less access to things like parks and green areas so mm -hmm. still suffering from this urban heat island effect um and can't what does your data say about you know, we have a solution, air conditioning. What are the problems with that solution? It's uh, there's a real challenge with trying to encourage uh, people to use air conditioning in that we're also trying to, you know, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So more air, con air, more air conditioning use, that leads to more energy consumption, which leads to more greenhouse gas emissions, which leads to more, you know, greater temperature increases, which then means you need more air conditioning. So it's, it's a bit yeah. of a vicious cycle. Yeah. And... Really, if we were to like say come up with a policy, which I would strongly recommend, uh, that is to like encourage air conditioning use, especially among vul vulnerable populations, we really need to think about cutting back on emissions elsewhere. So maybe taking fewer vacations, uh, riding the bus more, biking. Um, but it seems like the benefits of air conditioning are too great just to like put them on pause. So air conditioning saving lives. You should turn on your air conditioner and maybe catch the bus instead to help mitigate climate change. Ideally, yeah. yeah <laughs> ideally. All right. So I want to talk about infrastructure in just right. a second. Um, okay. First of all, innovation. So it's I heard from the podcast that um, the state of California is really well prepared for last century, but the infrastructure in this state is aging, as we all are, um, and not really ready to deal with the challenges that are coming as climate change gets worse. Um, so what are some of the things, the policies that we need to change or the infrastructure that we need to improve here in California? So my, my strong opinion is that we need to be building up in California. 
We have, Instead if you, of out and out yeah, we're, we're going out and out and out again. And that goes back to the point I was saying about people have to travel farther to get to work. And the more people are tra traveling, um, that means more greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which means more climate change. Uh, it's also means just more time sitting in your car. And so if you have low income families on the outskirts, they're just, they're losing some time, some valuable time with their family. So we need to be building up and that's going to, that's going to actually lead to, to great savings in greenhouse gas emissions, which is going to keep temperatures cooler, which is going to mean, you know, maybe you don't need to spend as much on the air conditioning. All right. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> saving climate, saving greenhouse gas emissions. But what's it going to cost financially to change the way we do things? Uh, to change the way we do things, that's uh, that's a bazillion dollar question. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, uh, that would. Why aren't we doing it already? I think there's some there's some political issues with trying to convince certain areas, say like Santa Monica, mm -hmm. uh, to build up because everybody has a nice view of the beach and they have it all to themselves. They may not want to build up and you know like have more people and more crowding. So, you know, that's really too bad because Santa Monica is also like it's on the beach. It's, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's also relatively cool. So mm -hmm. living closer to the beach and the ocean is another good adaptation strategy. Unfortunately, the political power along the coast, you know, they would, I don't think they would approve. So there's a lot of like environmentalists and people that really care for the environment living in places like Malibu and Santa Monica. Yeah. That really don't want to help us out by letting people build these high rise structures. It's a bit, it's a bit frustrating. It's a bit frustrating because, you know, they, they, I, at least in, you know, anecdotally, it seems like they do care about the environment incredibly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the returns to having more people living on the coast, that means, again, air, less air conditioning. Uh, you're protecting vulnerable populations, low-income families, uh, minorities. Like, we could be, like, using this as a great equalizing policy, right? It's only, the, the U.S. is only becoming more unequal over time. And this issue of residential zoning. More unequal financially? More unequal wealth fi financially. Mm -hmm. uh, the gap between black and white families is just gigantic and it's only increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and I think that this is, playing, this, this is playing into it. So you could actually kill two birds with one stone. Like people care about equality and people care about the environment. And building up is one way to get both of, at both of those things. Ooh, that's going to be a hard sell. <laughs> I, I, I think so. And this is why I think that there's going to have to be some, maybe some top down decisions. So leaving it up to local, local areas, no one's going to want to vote for more. That not in my neighborhood. Not in my neighborhood. I want higher, you know, high, higher home prices. So nobody is going to vote that way. But unless we just make a blanket rule saying like, hey, like you have to allow homes that go up at least for like high, the high density homes that go up four stories or whatever. Um, so I want to talk about that. As you okay. said, like, the top-down approach. So no local community is going to be the one to take on the burden if they can avoid it. Yes. Um, but you're a smart pe a smart person. You work with smart oh. people over at UCLA. That's very kind. I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's lots of effort going into science. But some of these uh, solutions seem to be you know, great ideas that are pretty easy to implement, just build up. But we don't necessarily have the 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 political will to make them happen. So how do you actually light a fire, so to speak, um, and get people to make those top-down decisions? How can we as citizens motivate policymakers to make the types of hard choices that need to be made? I th one, one creative solution that people have talked about is actually taxing, like raising property taxes so that, like say you do have a home on the beach uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of flat, one story. And we just charge higher property taxes and we base it off of the space and not necessarily the value of the home. So your actual area, because it could house like four or five floors of apartment buildings, will charge you a really significant property tax. And then maybe it just becomes, you know, less desirable to maintain just a single single family unit home. Uh, you'd actually have just the ad incentive to to build up at that point. Like an opportunity tax. You could yeah. have five people. Yeah, it's just you, like so. yeah. What is the the capabilities for this particular piece of land? And if it's that you could put a four story building there and 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 it's safe and 
uh, economical and you can get more families in there. It's just a lot of lost opportunity. I like, I like how you said that. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. So just changing the way that we're charging for land, changing the way that we're valuing financially the, the land that we have mm-hmm. in order to make the city better for everyone. Yes. Well, it sounds like in the state of California, there's a lot of challenges coming as climate change starts to hit harder and harder. Um, should we all be just moving to Alaska to avoid climate change? Well, people people do like living in nice temperate climates, and I think it will be inevitable to some degree that people will move in response to climate change. It actually happens uh Somewhat, you know, in, in Louisiana right now, the, the coast is disappearing. So some small, smaller communities have been relocated. Uh, but you're going to see this also just people's own will are going to say, like, look, it's just undesirable to live, you know, on, the, you know, Central Valley, California, where it gets extremely hot during the summer and people will just start moving north. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, the people that will move are the ones that have the adaptive resources, the ones that have the income and the wealth. I like the way you that. say that. Adaptive resources. <laughs> yeah, it's so. So again, it's, money to move. <laughs> it goes back to this. This huge environmental threat is going to impact people differentially. People who have low incomes, less wealth, less ability to adapt, they're going to be hit harder. Mm. And that's that's an that's a concerning fairness and equity issue to me. Here in the United States, globally you, as well, and globally as well. Yeah, India. Uh, many developing countries are like at great risk, and it's and it's tragic in the sense that they've also contributed much less to greenhouse gas emissions, but they will potentially be paying the greater burden. Um, and in the United States too, the South, like the South, where it's already poorer, uh, they're going to experience more more warming, and uh, that's going to be bad for them. And they're already poor. Mm. And that's that's upsetting. And l- most likely to suffer in cases of extreme weather. And- yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, they, and even though they have air conditioning, that's going to be a huge cost for them. Yeah. All right. It's their energy bills are going to go up significantly. Now, that's all about heat and your work on uh, climate change and how, how the urban heat island effect affects people. What other research are you working on there at UCLA? Uh, so I'm uh, as an economist. I still don't understand how this works. <laughs> so, so as an economist, I became interested in this question of how the environment affects human health because, well, but that's first not off, the economy. For, for, uh, that's very true. So, so uh, at least on the surface. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I'm working on right now that I'm very interested in is how how these heat waves affect infant health and timing of deliveries. Oh. So whether or not uh, heat waves lead to, you know, pregnant women giving birth sooner than they would have otherwise. Yeah, so I was yeah. born two weeks early and I was born in August. And actually, I looked back in the data and it was particularly hot. So so I wanted to know whether or not that's that hot weather causes early deliveries. Now, that's an important question, scientific question in its own right. But as an economist, I'm interested in that because early deliveries potentially mean more hospitalization. Mm. So that's that's a short-term cost to the economy, healthcare resources. But there's also the potential for long-term economic costs. If you shock young children, these this physiological harm could last them into their adulthood and their lives are just going to be less they're just going to have less capabilities. Yeah. Economic capabilities. Now it, it could be small, it could be modest, it could be large and that's something that I'm trying to investigate. Have you got any preliminary data? Did you get- <laughs> so so I found that heat waves as you might expect actually leads to much earlier deliveries up to 2 weeks early. Wow. And uh, uh, that's that's kind of frightening and actually the magnitude is pretty large. So at least 8% of births wow. like that are surrounding these heat waves, there's an 8% of the births are, are caused to be early. So people that probably don't, are living in hot areas, probably without it, the least access to being able to cool yourself down, least access to air conditioning, are the ones having early deliveries and that has adverse effects therefore on offspring. And, and that, those off, that, that effect on the offspring is going to be lasting into their adulthood. So this potentially could lead to persistent effects. And for, if you're thinking about this affecting low-income families more, that could lead to them having lower incomes for generations and generations for generations. Because when they're pregnant, they also have less resources and they're more vulnerable to these heat waves. And just can't get out of that cycle. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a poverty trap. Welcome to America. So, Alan, where can people find more about your work and about you? 
Uh, so you can find more about my work if you go to UCLA's webpage for the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And you can also follow me on Twitter. Be one of my, maybe my 400th follower. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have more than 400. So everyone go and subscribe to Alan Barreca's uh, Twitter account. We'll get it into the 400s. Uh, you can also check out Alan on the California Adapts podcast. It's caladaptspodcast.org or americaadapts.org. Thank you so much for joining us, Alan. Thanks for having me.